Welcome, everybody. It uh, gives me pleasure to introduce uh, Kevin Rapaski as our speaker today. Kevin is Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Montana State University. He holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and master's and doctoral degrees in physics, so he can do everything. Um, he's been at Montana State University in one capacity or another uh, since 1989. He started out as a grad student there. Um, in his work, he has um, delved deep into both active and passive optical remote sensing techniques. He's been an, an affiliated scientist here at NCAR since uh, 2013. Um, today he's going to talk about thermodynamic profiling of the lower troposphere uh, with differential absorption LIDAR. Kevin. So, thank you. I would like to thank um, for the invitation to speak and thank everybody for coming. Uh, so as was mentioned, I'm going to be talking about ground-based, eye-safe, networkable micropulse differential absorption LIDAR for thermodynamic profiling in the lower troposphere. Excuse me, can you turn your microphone off? Oh, I'm sorry. I've got too many things going on up here. Does that work? Thank you. Um, my co-authors are Scott Spuler. We've been working together now about seven years on this project. Uh, Matt Heyman's been working on this project for several years now as well. Catherine Bunn's a graduate student at Montana State. She's been working on this project about a year and a half. And Robert Stilwell joined us about a year ago as a postdoc here at uh, NCAR. So just real briefly, I don't need to talk too much about this to this audience, but the need for thermodynamic profiling, um, two recent National uh, Research Council reports, um, including when weather matters and observing weather and climate from the ground up, really discussed what the science community um, uh, needs in terms of remote sensing instrumentation um, that was followed up by a community-based workshop here at NCAR, um, and that, the recommendations from that workshop were sent to the National Science Foundation. And more recently, a, uh, a review paper um, was published uh, detailing the state of the art for thermodynamic profiling. And the key points from this paper uh, are listed here. Huge observational gaps exist in the lower troposphere a thermodynamic, uh, uh, huge, can't read that. So uh, huge observational gaps exist in the lower troposphere. Uh, closing these gaps is essential and ground-based passive and active remote sensing instrumentation are potential solutions to this problem. So we're working on developing active remote sensing instrumentation uh, that are ground-based that can be deployed in network configurations and hopefully can operate for long periods of time to really address the needs expressed by that group of reports uh, and papers uh, for thermodynamic profiling. So let me first start by um, talking about light detection and ranging. So this is LIDAR. A LIDAR consists of, um, so I get my mouse working here, a transmitter and an optical receiver. The transmitter sends out a pulse of light. And so what I'm going to be talking about is the thing we actually measure is this P of lambda. It's a function of wavelength and range. We send out a pulse of light. That pulse of light um, has a pulse duration delta T. So this is a pulse length. That pulse of light travels through the atmosphere, some of the light scattered, some of the light's absorbed. So that's taken into account by this term T, which is a transmission through the atmosphere. Light is scattered, and that light could be scattered either from aerosols or molecules in the atmosphere. The beta tells me something about how much of the light is scattered per unit solid angle. The scattered light then travels back through the atmosphere, so we pick up a second transmission term. Uh, and then, because the backscatter is telling me something about how much light is scattered per solid angle, the area of the telescope divided by r squared is the solid angle seen by my optical receiver. I have to take into account some of the geometrical optics uh, for the receiver. That results in this overlap function. 
then the receiver optics have an efficiency I need to take account of, and then the detector has an efficiency I need to take account of. And so in the end, when we get returns from the atmosphere collected by a LIDAR system, this is what our returns look like. Uh, and so beyond this point, we're in full overlap. Our signal falls off as approximately 1 over r squared. Before this line, the geometric, op geometric optics of the telescope cause this overlap. And then here I'm hitting uh, actually a mountain a couple kilometers away. So that's what our LIDAR system tells us. And by looking at, different, looking at these return signals in different ways, we can determine different things about our atmosphere. I'm going to be talking a lot about differential absorption LIDAR. And here, the dial technique with differential absorption LIDAR, we're going to use two closely spaced wavelengths. And so what's nice is our instrument isn't going to rely on any calibration because we're going to assume the atmosphere affects both wavelengths in the same way, except for absorption from the molecule that we're interested in. And so if I come over to this plot, I'm looking at the absorption cross-section as a function of wavelength. And we're seeing some absorption features from water vapor. Uh, there's some strong lines. There's some weaker lines we need to worry about. And if I use one wavelength at one of these strong absorption features, I'm going to get a bunch of light absorbed, so I'll see much less light at my receiver for my LiDAR system. And then if I come down to one of these valleys, I'm not going to get much absorption from a molecule of interest. It's all get more light that comes back. And so the difference between the return signals at these two closely spaced wavelengths is related to the molecular number density. And so over here, again, we see the overlap. We see if we're on an absorption feature, we get more absorption, so we see less signal. If we're off that absorption feature, we get less absorption, we see a stronger signal. And finally, we can calculate the number density using this dial equation. We measure these online and offline powers, as I discussed in the previous slide, so these things are measured. These cross-sections are things that we know, and so we can then retrieve this number density. So that's how our differential absorption LIDAR measurement works. Okay. Now, choosing an absorption line, you have to be very careful. If we're working with water vapor, we want that absorption line to have no temperature dependence because we can get more accurate results that way. So we want to choose a temperature insensitive absorption feature. We want to make sure we have an appropriate line strength. And then we want to be free of interference from other absorption features. Okay. And so if I begin looking at the line strength as a function of temperature for different ground state energies, I see when I have a ground state energy of about 200 inverse centimeters, I get a relatively flat line. So if I want a temperature insensitive absorption feature, I want to be between sort of this yellow and this gold line in terms of the ground state energies. Furthermore, um, once I pick a line, uh, we pick this line at 828.187 uh, nanometers, which is water vapor absorption uh, that we're going to work with. We chose this line after looking at a couple years of meteorological data in Bozeman to make sure that we had an appropriate line that will work in the wintertime. And then uh, as the summertime rolled around, we're, we have the ability to tune off of this absorption feature onto a sideline so that we can choose the right absorption cross-section for the prevailing atmospheric conditions. And finally, our offline we're well removed from this absorption feature where the absorption cross-section is a couple orders of magnitude lower than this peak value. Okay? And so the absorption line that we chose, online wavelength of 828.187, our offline wavelength is 0.1 nanometers away, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The line strength for that line is given as about 1.5 times 10 to the minus 23. Um, it's a pressure broadened line, and the ground state energy is appropriate for a temperature insensitive line. 
And I'm gonna put this plot up. This is an interesting plot, and I'll come back to this, this later. Semiconductor lasers can cover a broad spectral range, so with the same technology, um, we can cover a whole bunch of different wavelengths. And I'm showing from about uh, 0.77 microns up to about um, 8 point, or 0.83 microns. The water vapor absorption features are shown in red, so there's a lot of them. We chose the one at 828.187 nanometers, which is approximately this line. But there's also oxygen absorption features, and I'll come back to that when I talk about temperature profiling later in this talk. And there's things like rubidium cells where high spectral resolution LIDAR can be made at seven, about 780 nanometers. And so there's a lot of different LIDAR systems we can make with the same basic technology. And I'll talk about a little bit of detail about the water vapor. Um, I'll briefly introduce the high spectral resolution LIDAR that's work being done here at NCAR. Uh, and then I'll talk about some of our future work uh, and some of the modeling we've done based on the uh, differential absorption LIDAR for the um, oxygen. So about 15 or 17 years ago, we started working on developing diode laser-based differential absorption LIDAR. And we were one of the few groups actually working in this area. A lot of people um, didn't really think that this technology can really make measurements. Uh, I'm going to talk just briefly about the second generation instrument we built. We used basically an external cavity diode laser. This was in the uh, Littmann Metcalf configuration shown here. And this laser was able to tune to the on and offline wavelengths mechanically using a piezoelectric transducer that uh, allowed this laser to be tuned. Uh, we went through a first semiconductor optical amplifier to increase the power, and we found that we needed to go through a second semiconductor optical amplifier uh, to get enough power to make measurements, and we began working with commercial semiconductor optical amplifiers. I uh, used a wave meter to lock our wavelength, uh, and the nice thing about the wave meter is it's an absolute measurement and we can lock then to the center of the line or anywhere along the side of the line, which gives us a lot of flexibility. Uh, we use a schmidt cassegrain telescope, collect the light, um, and then we focus that light into multi-mode fiber, uh, used an avalanche photodiode and a multi-channel scaler. Uh, here's a picture of the instrument in the lab. Uh, here are all the optics, here's the telescope. We would bring the beam up over the top of the telescope and use a mirror um, mounted on the secondary mirror to send the light out. And then here's our optical receiver, all the electronics. Now we are excited with this second generation instrument because we made the first daytime measurements with the diode laser based uh, dial instrument. It took about 30 minutes of averaging, 15 minutes at the online, 15 minutes at the offline wavelength. And this was one of our first daytime measurement plots. It's a false color plot showing the water vapor number density that's uh, shown as these colors as a function of range and time. We launched a radio sonde that's shown uh, as the dashed line. And then our retrieval is shown as the solid line and an estimate of error bars are shown. And so we're excited to see this data, but there are a lot of issues with this generation two instrument and so we started to improve that by going to a third generation instrument. And here, we began using two lasers, one for the online, one for the offline wavelength. We started using high power external cavity lasers that let us tune and then stay at a wavelength. These then put out enough power that we were able to get rid of the pre-amplifier, so we only needed one semiconductor optical amplifier. And we started to do a lot of our own development of these semiconductor optical amplifiers in terms of mounting and the optics that go into them. And then that light, uh, and we also started using uh, MEMS-based switches for switching between seeding our amplifier with the on and offline wavelengths. Uh, so here's a picture of the 
semiconductor optical amplifier mounts that we originally started with. And these are uh, all the optics are in this part of the mount, and then we have a big heat sink back here. Here's a picture of the laser transmitter. Here's the two external cavity diode lasers. Oops, excuse me. Uh, here's the two external cavity diode lasers. Here's our optical amplifier. These are the MEMS based switches. And then here's a picture of this instrument in the lab. A graduate student working on this at the time was also working at NASA, so he got really excited about trying to package this in a small package. And then this whole thing sat on the back side of a telescope, and we used then just these tripod mounts that were given. And so here we improved the performance of the instrument quite a bit. We were able to get uh, water vapor profiles using about a 10 minute online and 10 minute offline, or about a 20 minute averaging time. Uh, we had 150 meter resolution. That's based on the pulse duration that we chose, a one microsecond. We did that to three kilometers, then above three kilometers, we averaged over a larger range. And we got reasonably good results. Um, here is a, ah, uh, here's an example of uh, uh, some data that we got. Uh, the blue is our dial instrument and the red is the radio sound, so we felt we were doing pretty well at this point. And then this just starts to talk a little bit about our march towards building a um, field deployable instrument. Kind of the big things to note is our first generation instrument where we're making measurements at nighttime started at about 100 nanojoules per pulse. We got excited when we got up to about with our second generation instrument about two microjoules per pulse. And then when we began working on our own amplifier systems, that's up to about five or six microjoules per pulse. We did some spectral purity measurements a while ago and found that the spectral purity of these uh, instruments was reasonably good. And so we are very excited at this point. However, uh, there still was a lot of technical challenges that we needed to overcome before we can really deploy this instrument in the field. Now, Montana State, we don't have very many people working on <clears throat> active LIDAR systems. There's basically myself. And so with limited resources, we really needed to col collaborate with some outside people who can really bring some expertise to taking this instrument and getting it ready for the field. And so in about 2011, um, Scott invited me down here to NCAR to give a technology innovation forum talk. And uh, then Scott and Tammy Weckworth visited Montana State. And um, from those initial discussions, we formed a collaboration. And really what follows is based on this collaboration. We are now at a generation five instrument uh, we've gotten rid of the um, external cavity lasers and we're using now distributed Bragg reflector lasers. And that's nice now because these lasers are packaged very well. We don't have to worry about things like mode hops and this makes this instrument much more stable, particularly for long-term deployment. Uh, we split a little bit of the light off, 10%, from both the online and offline distributed Bragg reflector lasers, and we send that to the wave meter. And that wave meter lets us lock both the online and offline wavelengths, so we can lock anywhere along our absorption feature, and that's been useful because we've deployed this instrument in Bozeman, which is pretty dry. It's also now been to, um, uh, down here at NCAR, it's been to Oklahoma, so it's been to several places where the Atmospheric conditions vary quite a bit, so the ability to work offline is a very useful feature for this instrument. And we can lock then the offline wavelength at a set distance away from the online wavelength, and I'll tell you why we need to do that in a few moments. We've also put in um, a series of one by one and then a two by one switch to switch between the online and offline wavelengths. And we do that to minimize crosstalk and try to maintain a high spectral purity. The 
a tapered semiconductor optical amplifier that lets us create our pulsed light. So that's where we're getting our pulses of light, about a microsecond in duration, about five microjoules uh, in, in uh, pulse energy. And then we use some beam shaping uh, using a matched axicon pair, and that lets us create a, a donut shaped beam. And that donut shaped beam is matched into the telescope using our uh, matching lens, and it fills up the inner half of the telescope after going through a borehole in the elliptic mirror. And so this telescope is nice because we're using a shared telescope geometry. So light collected in the outer half of the telescope then is, comes back and it's reflected by the elliptic mirror into the receiver. And so the shared telescope geometry is, is proven to be very stable uh, and it's allowed us to put these instruments in the field or operate for months at a time without doing much in terms of uh, adjusting uh, any of the outgoing or incoming uh, optics. We're using a two-stage uh, uh, receiver. The first stage collects the light, puts it into a multi-mode fiber, and then takes it to the second stage. And this is important because that scrambles any angular dependence of the light coming from our lower atmosphere. And that's important for getting through the narrow band filters in the Adelon um, uh, without any range dependence. Uh, one of the keys to making this technology work is the spectral filtering. We're currently using two narrow band filters in an Adelon, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, we're using avalanche photodiodes, so we're doing photon counting, and then we're using a multi-channel scaler to um, collect that data. So here's a picture of um, uh, one of the units actually we just brought down and we're getting set up down here. So here's the two DBR lasers. These lasers then are fiber coupled. Uh, there's the one by one and two by one optical switches. Uh, we have a, uh, our tapered semiconductor optical amplifier and we've redesigned those, those amplifiers to make them much smaller. And we're actually using the breadboard now as the heat sink and we've developed um, a more compact uh, uh, driver for our optical amplifier. Uh, here's our matched axicon pair, which creates the donut shaped hole. And then there's our telescope coupling lens, so you're not seeing the telescope in this picture. Uh, here's the first stage of the receiver that collects the light, sends it through multi-mode fiber to scramble, to, uh, scramble any um, uh, depend, angular dependence from the lower atmosphere. And then we have our second stage of the receiver, and there's our avalanche photodiode. So this is our optical breadboard at this point. Now, as I said, the key to making this technology work is the spe uh, spectral filtering, so the dial operates in the photon counting mode. Um, Sun puts out lots of photons and can easily saturate the detector. And so we really need a way to discriminate from our signal and then the rest of the spectrum. And we do that by using two, uh, two filters, two narrow band filters. And so in plot A here, uh, we see uh, this is the transmission for one filter in the blue and then the second filter in the black. Uh, and those, those work well for eliminating a lot of the uh, background light. We use two filters because that helps us over where the photon detector can see, it helps eliminate any um, noise that would come through there. And then we found that we really needed uh, more spectral filtering, so we've gone to an Adelon. Uh, this is an Adelon with a finesse of about 40 has a free spectral range of 0.1 nanometers. And so this then becomes our transmission, uh, our spectral transmission for our filter, so very narrow lines. Now these Adelons have a free spectral range of 0.1 nanometers, so we keep our online and offline wavelengths locked 0.1 nanometers apart, and then we use adjacent um, longitudinal modes in our cavity so that those, they're both the um, online and offline wavelengths are 
are resonant and we don't have to tune the cavity at all. We're using a finesse of approximately 40 for these cavities and our Adalon pass band is temperature tunable. And so here's where our Adalon sits in our receiver. This is a heat sink. We have a little thermoelectric cooler here that allows us to adjust the temperature. And so here, if I look at this plot, this is a plot of the uh, resonant frequency as a function of temperature. And we have a tuning range of about 0.0041 nanometers per degree C. And then over here, we were just looking at, in terms of locking stability, uh, the, trans the effects of the transmission through the cavity um, uh, as, as, as a function of locking stability. And we see that um, with the locking stability we have, that isn't a problem for what we're trying to do. Okay. Now, here's our Generation 5 instrument put in its environmental housing. Uh, we've now gone to a custom telescope. It's an F3 telescope, a Schmidt, or a, it's not a Schmidt castrin, it's a, um, a Newtonian, I think. Uh, we have our electronics now on the rack, uh, and then our optical board up here, and then this whole thing can be monitored via, via the Wi Fi. We also monitor the surface temperature, pressure, and relative humidity. Um, this housing was really designed down here at NCAR, and it's just been a, um, looks like it's doing a wonderful job. We now have five of these housings that we're trying to assemble this week. Hopefully we'll get there. Uh, and then these are pictures that Scott has kindly shared with me. Picture of the housing in the winter time down here at NCAR, and then this is the housing being deployed at, um, in Portugal at a recent field experiment. So here's uh, some data validation, uh, looking again here at height as a function of t time. This is a 12 hour period. The false color um, plot is giving us our uh, uh, um, water vapor in grams per cubic meter. And during this time, there were 11 uh, sons launched indicated by these black vertical lines. And each of these songs you can see are shown in the blue, and then our water vapor dial is shown in the red. And you see good agreement between both the sond and what our um, water vapor dial was measuring. And interestingly enough, you see this elevated layer of water vapor um, coming up and then dissipating, and our um, water vapor dial picks that up very easily. This instrument's been put out in the field um, with an ARI and the microwave radiometer. So this is just a comparison, looking at uh, water vapor as a function of height uh, and time. And this now time scale is starting to go over several days. Um, we start, we see a better vertical structure than the ARI and the microwave radiometer. Uh, and people seem to be excited about these types of plots. And so our instrument's doing as well as the area and the microwave radiometer and the lower couple kilometers of the atmosphere. Um, the instrument now, um, we have uh, two instruments operational. These have been going to field campaigns. Here's a plot uh, from the front range um, atmospheric pollution and photochemistry experiment that was down here in Colorado. The top plot is a normalized relative backscatter. So it's speaking to something about where the aerosols are in the atmosphere. Uh, you're seeing clouds come into play here. And then down here, you see the water vapor number, or water vapor, um, <clears throat> and that's in grams per cubic meter as a function of range and time. And now you're starting to see this thing go from uh, July up through, uh, uh, or, uh, up through August. So you're starting to see a long, lot longer field deployment. And this instrument operates uh, well above 90, 95% uptime for data. Uh, instrument next went to the Plains Elevated Convection at Night experiment. This was in Kansas. And again, much higher water vapor uh, content in the atmosphere. 
So the ability to tune on to the sideline becomes important. Again, looking at the um, normalized relative backscatter and the water vapor number density, uh, high uptime for this data. So this instrument seems to be working very well. Uh, more recently, this uh, instrument was at the Pertigo field experiment in Portugal. Again, looking at the normalized relative backscatter and then the water vapor number density. You're seeing much higher water vapor number densities in Portugal. Uh, again, we have the clouds coming down here. So we can see in the daytime up to three to four kilometers or up to cloud base with this instrument. And then more recently, this was at the um, land atmosphere feedback experiment in Oklahoma. Again, showing the um, uh, normalized relative backscatter gives us an idea of the aerosol loading in the atmosphere and the water vapor number density as a function of time. And again, this is operating for a couple months at a time now with um, operational times up above 95% or so. Okay, so let me sum up with the water vapor. Um, we've built an instrument, we've validated the data. Um, we've deployed this instrument at some recent field campaigns. Um, this instrument's next scheduled to go to Argentina this fall. And we're working on completing a network of five instruments. Currently, unit one is done. It's in an environmental housing. Unit two is operational. Um, and it's been to the, I think that was at the Lafay field campaign. Uh, we need to put it in its environmental housing yet. And we just brought down units three through five. So to give you an idea of the size of these instruments, units three through five came down to Boulder from Bozeman in the back of a Subaru and a CRV. So it gives you an idea of, of uh, these instruments. And I like to show this because this shows, here's our uh, second generation instrument. We have our third generation instrument shown here and here. So the fourth generation instrument where we went to the shared telescope design, and then here's the generation five instrument where this thing is currently at. Okay, so I'm gonna move on and talk about temperature uh, profiling. So for the water vapor, we chose a temperature insensitive absorption feature. We were able to get the number density for water vapor. If we look at a molecule with a known mixing ratio in the atmosphere, and oxygen has a known mixing ratio. And we choose an absorption feature that's temperature sensitive, we should be able to back out the temperature as a function of range in our atmosphere by measuring the absorption fe feature associated with oxygen. However, several technical challenges have really hindered this development of an O2 dial for temperature profiling but we think that a, a diode laser-based dial and LIDAR instruments may provide a path forward. So what do I mean? So here are um, some of the uh, major barriers to implementing an accurate O2 dial temperature measurement. Um, the systematic errors such as spectral purity, spectral stability, matched beam direction, et cetera, must be reduced uh, to the greatest extent possible. And we've already demonstrated a low systematic errors with our current water vapor system, so that's nice. Uh, to measure um, temperature using an O2 dial, you need to know water vapor profiles of less than plus or minus two grams per cubic meter. We're already measuring that with our water vapor dial at plus or minus less than one gram per cubic meter, so that's good. But here's, the, here's where the real hang-up starts to come in to play, is you really need to understand the contribution of the Doppler broaden Rayleigh scattering to the total signal backscatter and backscatter ratio. And you need to know that within a few percent. So what's happening is as you scatter light from the heavy um, aerosols, the light then maintains uh, the laser wavelength line width but when you scatter from light molecules, you get Doppler broadening that's on the order of your absorption feature, and so you have to take that into account. Well, the work here at NCAR, um, uh, we can use the high spectral resolution LIDAR technique 
to really look at the contribution of the Doppler broad and Rayleigh scattering to the total signal. So that's a way that we can um, alleviate the problem of knowing the relative contribution of the Doppler broad and Rayleigh scattering. And finally, a retrieval technique for the absorption coefficient of O2 is needed. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. We just um, managed to get a paper accepted for publication on a new retrieval technique um, that I'll briefly introduce here. But first, for the aerosol profiling um, here at NCAR, they've developed a high spectral resolution channel, and they've added that to dial or to our unit two of our water vapor dial network. And the idea is because the aerosols are heavy and don't move much, they scatter, and the light scattered has the same spectral width of the laser, which is very narrow. And that's shown here as this little peak at the top. And then the light scattered from the molecules is very broad from the Doppler broadening. And so if you have a filter with a very narrow notch and you send your light received through this filter, you essentially block the light scattered by your aerosols and you're just measuring the light scattered by the molecules. That lets you then back out the backscatter due to molecules and the backscatter due to aerosols. And so this is an interesting figure because you might recognize from before, here's the two DBRs for the water vapor, here's the switches for the water vapor, the shared telescope, Here's the receiver for the water vapor. But another laser at 780.24 nanometers was added. And that laser is also locked using the wave meter. A second tapered semiconductor optical amplifier was added. That light then is um, combined using a dielectric mirror, sent through the tel shared telescope. And then at the receiver, we add another receiver channel water vapor is measured here, and then the aerosol measurements are made in this uh, uh, other receiver stage where part of the light is split. You measure the total backscatter signal. Part of the light goes through a rubidium cell that blocks the aerosol, so you measure the molecular scatter. And from that information, you can then get how much light is scattered from the um, molecules and how much light is scattered from the aerosols. So here's some data that was shared um, by Scott and Matt uh, showing uh, water vapor number density as a function of time. This is over a day. And then here's the high spectral resolution. So this is the aerosol backscatter coefficient from the atmosphere uh, as a function of range and time. And so now we can get the light scattered from Doppler broadened, from Doppler, or the light scattered from molecules that's Doppler broadened and we know then how much light is scattered from the aerosols. So from that information, we can now come back to looking at our dial equation. And here I'm going to give you the full dial equation that contains uh, this term and this term. And I'll tell you what those are in a moment. Those are really accounting for the Doppler broadening of the scattered light from the molecules in the atmosphere. Our dial measures the um, number of return signals at two different wavelengths from different ranges. So that's what our dial measures. This is the absorption coefficient at the offline wavelength. So this is something that we know. This is what we need to retrieve, because if we can get this absorption coefficient, then we can back out temperature. And then we have these two other terms, the W of R and G of R, that depend on, this is the line shape, scattered line shape, that depends on the ratio of the aerosol to total backscatter and the molecular to total backscatter ratios. And then there's a delta function for the aerosol scattering to represent the laser line width, and then this is um, the Doppler broaden line width here. This E in these terms are associated with our etalon filtering. Uh, this is a line shape that has a weak temperature dependence. 
and then we have a transmission. Uh, just real quickly, this G is what the HSRL is measuring. And so this transmission is the last thing we need, but it has the thing we want to measure in an exponent, in an integral. And so if we look at this, the thing we want is in here, and then it's in an integral, in an exponent. So we have a transcendental equation that we can never pull out then this alpha directly. So we need some numerical techniques for making this measurement. To do that, we're looking at a perturbative solution. So here's our absorption coefficient. There's a zeroth order term and a first order correction. If we keep track in that dial equation I showed on the previous page of the zeroth order or the biggest terms in that equation, we get back to just our standard dial equation. So this is the thing that we measure. This is something we know, so we can calculate our zeroth order absorption coefficient. Once we know that, then we can look at this first order correction. These are the terms left in our full dial equation. But here, for this G and W, we can calculate those now by using a transmission based on our zeroth order absorption coefficient. And so that lets us then use this perturbative solution to estimate the absorption coefficient. This is really based on techniques developed in quantum mechanics, and so this is a pretty standard mathematical technique um, that we're applying in a new way to this dial equation. Okay. And so we've done a fair amount of modeling now. Uh, so let me start with the very simple this is a temperature profile as a function of range, just has a simple lapse rate. And I was playing around with putting in just a real small temperature inversion when I was doing some of this modeling. Here's a look at uh, the backscatter coefficient as a function of range. We have the molecular backscatter model shown as the red line, aerosol backscatter shown as the blue line, and then the black line as the total. Uh, backscatter profile. So we're using this to model our atmosphere. And then here is the uh, absorption coefficient of oxygen as a function of range. So this is the thing that we want to retrieve using our dial um, system. And so if I come over here and do some modeling, look at the dial equation, I can calculate the air as a function of range for the retrieved absorption coefficient. If I use just a zeroth order retrieval, so the standard dial equation, the air in the absorption uh, coefficient ranges anywhere from minus 5% up to about minus uh, 27%. So that's pretty bad. And in fact, that results in a pretty high temperature air. If we use a first order correction, we can greatly improve that air. It stays below a couple percent. But we can look at not only a first order solution, we can go to a second order solution. The math gets a lot hairier, so I'm not going to show that up here. But this purple line starts to show the air and the absorption coefficient using a second order, retrie second order perturbative retrieval solution. And we keep that air below about one and a half percent. And so that idea of the perturbative solution allows us to hone in on our absorption coefficient. And by doing that, we can then look at what kind of temperature air we would expect um, using our dial retrieval. If I just use a zeroth order retrieval, I get useless information, ranges anywhere from 2 to 10, almost uh, 12 degrees um, Kelvin air in my temperature retrieval. If I go to a first order perturbative solution, I can get below about uh, 2 Kelvin. Uh, and if I go to a, a second order perturbative solution, I can maintain errors of less than plus or minus one Kelvin in that retrieval. And so this starts to give us some hope of how to do our retrieval um, based on our O2 dial system. Now, um, at the request of, uh, I think Scott requested looking at a uh, uh, atmosphere where the temperature profile had a much bigger inversion, so it increased up to about two kilometers, then fell off at a lapse rate. 
So I'm going to use this to do the modeling uh, for my atmosphere. And I'm going to use this initial lapse rate in my um, uh, retrieval profile to see what happens. Okay. Uh, here, using this model temperature profile that affects our um, aerosol backscatter, molecular backscatter, total backscatter retrieval. In our mo modeled um, atmosphere, the absorption coefficient for O2 then is shown as this bottom line. This is the thing we're trying to get. If I look at the air as a function of range for the retrieved absorption coefficient, I'm going to start by guessing that this dashed line is the temperature profile. Go through my absorption or go through my retrieval and see what it tells me for the temperature. And that gives me this blue line over here, which is not all that great. But if I use the result from that first time through my solution, use that to calculate a new temperature profile and use that as a guess to go back through the solution, then I get a second time through the solution, sort of this red line. So I'm starting to get much closer to what the absorption coefficient should be. And then if I calculate a temperature profile based on that and use that as a starting point and go through my dial solution a third time, I can get even better in terms of the absorption coefficient that I retrieve. And so if I look at the temperature deviation, my initial guess is off by over 20 degrees. Um, the first, after the first iteration, I get within about 2 degrees. And then after the second iteration, I get within 1 degree up to about 5 kilometers. So this idea of using this um, a loop in your retrieval. So you guess at a temperature profile, use that to finish the retrieval, use your new retrieval or new temperature profile to get a second retrieval and keep doing that. You do converge on the actual absorption coefficient and it converges rather quickly. And so we've begun doing some estimates of the O2 dial instrument performance based on the instruments we built, just listed the parameters here in this table on the, on the left. Um, basically using the 2DBR as a single stage amplifier, um, the pulse duration, that should be one microsecond, uh, energy up to about seven microjoules. We're working at the 769.2 nanometer line. Um, using those, I can calculate the error in the retrieved absorption coefficient as a function of range. The red line shows the errors that come from the counting statistics for the O2 dial. So this is just based on the number of photons I'm getting back, how long I'm averaging for the O2 dial. And that's the actual dominant noise term for this instrument. The uh, blue line is the air associated with the HSRL retrieval of the molecular and aerosol backscatter. And then the green line is the air associated with our perturbative solution. And so if I add those airs in quadrature, I get then the total air shown as the black line. And you really see that the um, uh, counting statistics for the O2 dial is really the major source of air here. And that's nice because if we go to higher powers or longer averaging times, we can improve the performance of this instrument. And then here is just using the total air in my retrieval based on these various sources of air. I expect that I should be able to retrieve a temperature to within plus or minus a degree Kelvin up to about three and a half kilometers or so based on uh, um, parameters for an instrument that we can easily build. Okay. So quick summary. Uh, we've developed a dial laser-based LIDAR and dial instruments, and these have the potential to provide networkable ground-based thermodynamic profiling needed by the research community. We are currently finishing a network of five water vapor dial instruments, and these should be available for field deployment beginning around 2019. Uh, here at NCAR, an HSRL has been demonstrated for aerosol profiling. 
And finally, uh, temperature profiling using O2 dial has been modeled. Um, that's coming out in a paper that um, was accepted for publication. And we have all of the parts now to put this instrument together. And so when we head back to Montana this summer, that's the next thing on our to-do list is to start building this instrument. So let me acknowledge that the work um, was kindly supported by the National Science Foundation and then the National Center for Atmospheric Research is also sponsored by the National Science Foundation. And no matter how the talk goes, if I end with this, everybody walks away happy. So those are my dogs. So thanks kindly for your time and I'll entertain any questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, could you uh, summarize the temporal and spatial resolution of these temperature and humidity measurements? Say nominally one degree temperature and a gram per kilogram of water. So water about a one degree um, Kelvin for temperature. Um, with about a 10 minute averaging time, so it'll be a 10 minute sliding window. The water vapor is about um, less than a gram per cubic meter. Uh, that's 150 meter, these are all 150 meter resolution. Um, and that is about a five minute averaging time at this point. Okay. Other questions? So for this project, why is it better to use semiconductor lasers um, instead of like solid state lasers that are often used in LIDAR? So the question is, why are we using semiconductor lasers instead of um, pulsed solid state lasers? For one thing, semiconductor lasers um, cover a broad spectral range. And so there's commercially available lasers at 828.187 nanometers that we can go out and buy. Okay. Not only that, but diode lasers have broad spectral coverage, so moving to the 780.24 nanometers for the HSRL is very simple. It's just starting with a different seed laser and a different amplifier, but all the technology is the same. And then moving to the O2, again, the diodes we just looked up uh, were people selling the right diodes, able to buy those, able to buy the semiconductor optical amplifiers, they're all available. So one of the reasons is these are very spectrally, um, there's a lot of different wavelengths you can work at. Uh, so that's very nice. If I buy a YAG laser, I'm stuck at uh, 1064, 532, 355, unless I do something like build an OPO, which is a very difficult thing to build. It's a very difficult thing to put out in the field and operate for two or three months at a time. So that's one nice thing. Second nice thing is these lasers are relatively inexpensive. Uh, so the diodes that we're working with are a couple thousand dollars. The amplifiers are a couple thousand dollars. And then all of the optical components are there and ready for us to use. So that's nice. The other reason is they're small. Uh, we're working with eye safe types of instruments here because we want these to be um, net, we want these to be deployed for long periods of time, but we don't want to have somebody there spotting for aircraft, so these then become eye safe. So it's a, it's a function of spectral coverage, the cost, and these lasers are appropriate for low power networkable instruments. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, but so for the on and off lines, mm -hmm. uh, you said you used a piezoelectric transducer, like to change the wavelength? Oh, we, that was in some of our initial. Uh, lit instruments where we were using an external cavity diode laser oh. and that was tuning on and offline. Okay. Since then we've moved to distributed Bragg reflector. Well, since then we've moved to two lasers where they're just, they're fixed so we don't have to tune them. And then when we started collaborating with NCAR, um, one of the nice things about that was we were able to get a company to develop the 828.187 nanometer DBR lasers for us, and so that's been a very successful working with these companies as well. How much were you able to like modulate the operating wavelength using the piezoelectric transducer? 
So we've done a fair amount of work with external cavity diode lasers at Montana State. Um, we can tune about 10 to 15 nanometers with a typical external cavity, but that's not continuous tuning because you have mode hops. And so we did a lot of work with um, doing small modulations to know when you're going to bump up against a mode hop. So we were able to get continuous tuning ranges on the order of about, um, I think it was about 100 gigahertz. So that's where you can tune and have no mode hops. Other questions? I, I just have one. I, I'm curious in, in your um, iterative retrieval of the temperature mm -hmm. profile, mm -hmm. did, did you always have convergence? Did you run into any uh, I've, I problems? I haven't done an extensive um, modeling of that, but it seems to converge fairly rapidly. And the reason that I think that that is true is because if I come back to this equation, where that initial guess for the temperature comes into play is this line shape of the Doppler broadened. So that's the line shape associated with the Doppler broadening. And we've done some things in the math to get to this point. Um, and so, uh, but nonetheless, this Doppler broadening is not a strong temp. The Doppler broadening of the line shape for the for that is not strongly temperature dependent. So as long as you start with the reasonable guess, I think it will converge. But I haven't proven that exclusively. So that's something that we want to look at. Well, it, your your example of starting with a mm -hmm. uh, without the inversion in place, mm -hmm. and it's still could pick up the inversion. That, mm -hmm. Yes. That's so I think example. it will converge. I think the reason it does is because this is where you need an initial guess at the temperature profile. And this is weakly temperature dependent. Any other questions for Kevin? Well, let's thank him again. Thank you.